We have this wonderful symbol, as I said, the five years, five verticals, and the globe. And as you know, Expo 2020 will not only be the first Arab city hosting the Expo 2020, but also the first time that a city in Middle East, North Africa, and East and uh, South Asia, Yasa region, will have the, the Expo 2020. Uh, referring now to your wonderful book, the al Nasser Capital Diaries, the last five years. We don't know which book you will write in five years' time. The expectations are high. Anshu, I would like to start with you. What are the expectations? Can you please briefly sum up again what are the expectations for the Expo 2020 in relation to the UAE economy? I think uh, there's a great, a great deal of optimism in the market related to Expo 2020. Uh, given the way the market has developed over the last few years and given the way market is looking forward, Expo 2020 is one big development event for the whole region and definitely for Dubai. So the government of Dubai is going to spend a lot on public transportation, creating the supply chain, developing the site for which all the parts are needed and that's why looking at the local economy, looking at the regional economy, Expo 2020 is going to be a very big event. And if you look at some data, we've got about 2 to 3 million people living in Dubai and there's an expectation of about 25 million people who are going to be in Dubai during those 6 months. And if you look at a real life situation when we have uh, a fair like a, a food exhibition or an automotive exhibition, how crowded the city becomes. So to accommodate those 25 million people in those six months, and obviously there is a supply chain in construction, etc. Dubai will need a great deal of infrastructure to create the accommodation, to create the public transport, to create the residential, etc. Which will spur the consumption. And I guess if you look at Al Nasser from that perspective, our platforms, whether it's related to healthcare, education, FNB, logistics, are greatly related to that consumption. And that's why we feel, looking at 2020, looking at what the government is doing, look at what the private sector is going to do, I think there's a great deal of excitement on that. <laughs> Exciting, I found also the pasta we had at lunchtime that reminds me of Italy. And when I think of Italy, I think of Milan. I mean, Tava, we just finished the Expo 2015 in Milan in the northern Italian city. What, were, what was the roundup? What was the expectations? Were they fulfilled? Yeah, there was a lot of skepticism actually regarding the Milan Expo as to whether it will deliver all the expectations that it was a uh, typical expo is supposed to. And it just got concluded on the 31st of October, so the data is still coming in. But the preliminary reports they do suggest that there were over 20 million people who visited the expo over the six month period. You know, and in terms of uh, job creation, more than 200,000 jobs were created in Milan. So there is a great impact uh, that is expected to happen, uh, that has already happened during the event and which is expected to continue as well. In terms of pure numbers, what they are saying is that almost a 10 billion euro impact on the economy is expected and if you measure that against the cost of the capital expenditure and the running cost which has gone into uh, doing the expo, it is only 2.6 uh, billion euro. So that in itself speaks of the benefits that expo brings to the city, to the country that it is being held in. So overall it was a reasonably good and a successful expo. Thanks, well, thank you for taking on Milan. May I ask the delegates, did anybody attend Expo 2015 in Milan? Oh, now one hand up. From the place, sir. Two hands, yeah, Richard, of course. <laughs> okay, in, in five years' time, I want to see all hands up, please. Yeah, I think we are yeah, pretty uh, sure about this. Now, regarding health, let's, let's get down to the sectors. Regarding healthcare and education, and I know that healthcare is uh, your expertise, and Robert Ija, you are on education. Starting with the platforms at Almasa Capital, what opportunities do you foresee with the 2020 spending? Amitabha first, and then Robert Ija, please. Yeah, see, the Expo, as Ashwin has mentioned, you know, it's, it's a very large gathering of people. You know, it's 25 million people are expected to be in your city. Uh, 
many of them would be there before the event and probably a lot many would also stay back in the city. That's the expectation once they get familiar with the cities and the structure, etc. So all in all, even if you look at the job creation that is expected to be in Dubai, the initial estimates are that between 250 to 300,000 jobs they are going to be created just because of this one single event. And with that, there is a multiplier effect in the economy, you know. The people come to work, their families come here, then other people who come as visitors, they take up employment opportunities here. So there is a huge multiplier effect that happens on the population and on the economy. This is the economic benefit of the Expo. So looking particularly at the healthcare sector, this increase in population, that's going to increase the demand for any consumer-related service, not only healthcare, but any other consumer-related businesses, which is in terms of education or even in terms of the LMB, you know, that's going to receive a tremendous boost. And in healthcare terms, uh, that is a big opportunity if you consider the vision of the DHA, you know, 2030, 2025 vision, which talks a lot about the medical tourism. Uh, that is there in the country in which Dubai wants to position itself as a medical tourism hub. So it is an excellent opportunity for Dubai to showcase what is capable of in the healthcare segment. So in terms of infrastructure, in terms of its hospitals, its clinics, its diagnostics, in terms of any specialities which it wants to showcase, it may be wellness, it may be derma, it may be neuroscience, so whichever specialties, whichever capabilities, cancer, orthopedic surgery. So it wants to showcase to the world that yes, this is the place that you can avail those benefits uh, at reasonable costs. This is the opportunity that it can reach out to a very large population at one particular point in time. And to do that, therefore, we have to gear up both the private sector and the public sector in terms of making sure that our planning is inaccurate, the execution is perfect, that we are able to provide this infrastructure before the event happens, so that when the people come, they can experience this particular aspect of the event. Very good point. We heard this in the morning at the, in the uh, presentation. Right. The yeah. Health yeah. Yeah. The education and health go hand in hand. The yeah. yeah. health and education, this week we got the point, but education in general, this is something which the man on the street does not see at first. Why an Expo 2020 event should help the education sector in Dubai? What is your take on this point? Uh, well, uh, if you look at the current education landscape in Dubai, it is among the, one of the most developed uh, in the world. And it's thanks to the existing regulatory environment and large number of expatriate population uh, which are here. Now, Expo 2020 and its impact on education, the way I see it and continue to what Amitabha already mentioned about the job creation, the number of people uh, who will come and uh, its sustainable effect beyond Expo. What it will mean is that fine, when you have more professionals coming to the city, uh, they will come with their families and they will come and try to see uh, what are the other education opportunities uh, which are available uh, where they can put their children. Or uh, as a profile also, uh, the profile of Dubai will be more visible uh, among, uh, let's say, the students community uh, who would like uh, to come and uh, either uh, do the further education uh, out here. So when you look into the profile of different cities who have uh, developed into larger education hub uh, in the world, the first thing which happened uh, is economic development in those places. It can be London, it can be Singapore, or it can be any other centers. So uh, the way uh, Expo will contribute towards the education sector, uh, the way I see it is, uh, it will uh, create uh, more education, uh, say, uh, facilities, uh, and uh, education in, in itself can change the dynamics of the economy. Uh, like, uh, let's say, uh, there will be more uh, requirement for students' accommodation, uh, which is not the case uh, now in Dubai. Uh, there can be better higher education facilities, so all these uh, will be a byproduct of what uh, Expo 2020 will bring into the life. Amitabha just mentioned the cost factor. Uh, parents and uh, students always complain about the high costs for education. And uh, can this uh, additional supply also reduce costs in the next five years? Like, look, if you see uh, Dubai uh, in itself uh, and the regulatory environment, uh, it, is, it takes care of uh, how the education costs needs to be uh, maintained. So uh, to 
that is uh, fun. Uh, it is a very balanced uh, kind of environment uh, in terms of what uh, people they end up paying for uh, education. Uh, but uh, the key thing is uh, that fine, once uh, employment opportunity gets created, uh, there will be more disposable income uh, for the people and it will open up uh, different revenues uh, and different uh, say price points at which education can be given uh, to people out there. Excellent. Expo 2020 is headquartered the main area will be near Jabal Ali as we know and in Dubai World Central and this uh, brings us to the next point, logistics. We would like to stay with you Rupa Dija, and because logistics is a very capital intensive sector, we would like to share between Rupa Dija and Anjul because it's also important that the matter of massive capital. Fine, uh, Expo 2020 in itself is a great fit. So being a great fit, the government has and is planning to do a lot in terms of developing the, its current infrastructure, uh, be it, uh, uh, let's say, expansion of its uh, current uh, uh, road network, development of the ports or uh, the airports, uh, development of the rail network. So all of this, in effect, uh, will help the development of the logistics sectors. So this is uh, the way I see uh, Expo 2020 will contribute uh, as far as the logistics sector in Dubai is concerned. Further, uh, it will uh, make Dubai, uh, it already is a strategic location as far as the world trade in commerce uh, is concerned. On the one hand, you have the continent of Africa and uh, the other uh, developing economies. So uh, Expo 2020 will further strengthen the position of Dubai uh, as a hub uh, for doing, uh, let's say, uh, trade or business uh, beyond uh, the period uh, when Expo gets uh, over. So uh, uh, the logistics sector uh, will be one of the primary beneficiaries of Expo 2020. Uh, that's, that's the way I see uh, uh, its contribution uh, to the sector. Ashwin, do you want to and I think that, uh, uh, it, it is primarily a supply chain which needs to be fulfilled. Supply chain for uh, creating that uh, uh, site supply chain for the trade fair, the exhibition, the product which needs to reach there. Supply chain, even the, the new metro track has been announced to go up to that site from Ibn Batuta side. And whether it's the locomotive for that or whether it's the building and construction material for that, which all means is part of the logistics chain. So if, whether you see uh, something coming on the sea, something coming on the plane, and that's how the whole design of Metropolis as what they are trying to build with the Zivari Port, with the Dubai World Central and creating a logistics hub around there. I think that would be a great beneficiary for our logistics platform. Yes. And these visitors, their business, businessmen, families, friends and neighbors who come, they look around, they may see opportunities that first. People who never been to who never been to Dubai. Yeah, so Dubai, Dubai is uh, quite famous for it. People who come here. You know, while we can talk of 25 million people coming in for six months, we surely know that at least a good percentage of that people will never go back. They will bring their families, they will bring in their friends, even after the expo is over, because Africa is there, like my brother said, Russia is there. So if you have a great fulfillment as a city from the one. Yes, they all have to live somewhere and have to eat somewhere. So, so, so if you see the, the food supply chain, and Dubai is a big importer of everything, what we eat, what we consume, what we... so to create that supply chain and do uh, everything around food and beverage, create those restaurants, create the food filtering center, it would also need a, both a hot chain, cold chain and the full supply chain on that as well. Exactly. And they have to stay somewhere. We know that the current hotel capacities in Dubai are not sufficient to cater these 25 million visitors as you said with our projected. Um, Referring to the brilliant presentation this morning from Ian Alba from Colliers, he said there are at the moment 70,000, 70, 70,800 hospitality keys in Dubai, and the DTCM, the Dubai Tourism, official Dubai Tourism Body, estimates that 160,000 hospitality keys will be available in 2020. Now, does anybody know how many rooms the Ritz, DMFC Ritz Carlton, this hotel has? Okay, it's, I asked this in the, in the morning at the reception, at the reception that is 341 rooms. So the current hospitality keys means you have 207 Ritz Carlton, DIFC, DIFC Ritz Carlton hotels side by side. And I calculated in the break, 
if you if we uh, do by tools is successful with this estimation, and you have 160,000 hospitality key rooms, that would be 469 DIFC with Carlton hotels side by side. <laughs> Just as, as, as I am trying to scare the audience. So. No, no, no. <laughs> we want to be optimistic, but. Um, no, I, I am German national and I like to speak about numbers rather than about the weather. <laughs> that leads me for um, Amitabha on the question for hospitality. Now, how is the FFV industry poised to cope with this growing demand? I mean, there's not only sandwiches and glasses of water to, to give to the uh, visitors of Expo 2020, but what's the potential of FFV? F and B, uh, generally speaking, Dubai, uh, uh, you know, have always seen a very buoyant F and B market. You know, come Expo, not no Expo. F and B sector in Dubai has always been very vibrant. You know, you have new players coming in all the time, you have old players getting out at the same time. So this vibrancy is a characteristic of the city uh, in terms of food and beverage. We all love to, you know, eat out. The Dubai population is a lot of. Uh, uh, weekend socializing, you know, even uh, uh, during the week, a uh, lot of traffic during the dinner time. So, FMP generally has been a very hot sector uh, for Dubai as a city. So, once we impose the expo on this particular sector, I think the impact is going to be tremendous. So, in terms of all the development which we see uh, in the city uh, in various parts, uh, to my mind, it will not be sufficient uh, to even feed the 25 million people when they come over for the expo. So any FNB operator who is there in the city who is gearing up to the right locations and the right concepts, I think it's a fantastic opportunity for them to uh, really get benefit out of this event. But I think it should be... Uh, yes, actually, what you're saying, I think, so, uh, as I said, there are around 5,000 restaurants in Dubai today. But still, if you look at the newspaper every morning, there are more opening up every day. But uh, looking at the expo, looking at the 25 million people, you would need a lot of that to happen at the site and then in the city to cater to the needs of that time. So clearly, uh, from an f and perspective, we remain quite bullish. We need to put, make sure that we have the right concept, we have the right location, and we are in, in the forefront of that industry. But as an industry, it's definitely going to grow. Looking at the demographic and some of the numbers which we saw this morning, both in the healthcare presentations and some of the real estate presentations. So I don't think so there is a doubt about the growing demographic, growing population, growing economy. Now the question is how much of that share we are able to attract within our platform, within our effort. Right. I mean, Tabak, let's get back to you on oil. We can't ignore the price of oil. I mentioned also in the presentations earlier. I just checked the Oman futures contract on the Dubai Mercantile Exchange. It slipped below $40 per barrel. I can't remember. I have seen this price, so the trend uh, is a bit up now. But on the long term, the market looks a bit sumble. How much will Expo 2020 excite the market? Yeah, see, so Expo. Expo 2020, uh, you know, let's forget the oil price dynamic because there's a lot of factors that go on behind it, you know. But in terms of the economic impact of the Expo and its effect on the sentiment, so to say, I think there's a tremendous value that we can see of once the construction activity gets started in full force. We haven't seen that as yet. There's a lot of uh, projects that are still in the process of getting implemented. And once that starts off, I think the impact on the sentiment, and as uh, our previous panelists mentioned, that EVA is a market which is much more driven by sentiment than anywhere else in the world. You know, so once that sentiment picks up, if people see real action on the ground, projects getting built, a lot of influx of new people coming to execute those projects, so once that tempo starts to build up, I think then that is the major, let's say, uh, catalyst to the, to the markets. If you see the initial estimates which were actually published by Bank of America Merrill Lynch, they are, as per their report, almost $23 billion 
that's the impact that this expo is going to generate on UAE. And in terms of economic GDP growth, the figure says that between 2016 to 2019, it will add about half a percentage point growth to the GDP. And from 2020 and 2021 onwards, it will be a 2% effect on the GDP. So these are huge numbers. So if you translate it onto the market, there's surely much that we can expect from 2016 onwards, once the projects really get on the ground. But wait, I must say that not quite only diaries for great events like this, but also you do research, you have a research department. That's uh, true. Do they have a oil price forecast for 2016? Not that I know of. I mean, it's the like, <laughs> like a, a smile, it goes up. Beautiful, <laughs> yeah, beautiful. All right. Then, Andrew, do you, do you foresee demographic shifts for the 2020? And how would it impact different, different industries and businesses? Uh, okay. What will it impact on different businesses? I, I see a uh, positive side to it, uh, typically not negative. Uh, I think that uh, the risks which I see with it is my own supply chain. So if I have got an F&B business, uh, what, are, what is my supply chain and will it cater to the requirement of that EPL? I need to make sure from that those will be the challenge aspect to it. Whether I get the right E, whether I get the right friends to serve, because as we discussed, majority of the material is imported. And for me to get that supply chain back against my biggest challenge. On page uh, 2014, by the way, the diaries have no pages, but they are in uh, the chronological order of my years. I read it over lunch. You say all startups wrestle with challenges. Which are the, let's look at the challenges a bit. We have tailwinds, we have headwinds, of course. Which are the challenges and critical, critical success factors for these industries to capitalize in this big opportunity? Expo 2020. And I would like to start with Amitabh Health. Then we go to a particular on education and logistics and natural on F and B. The main challenge is essentially to gear up your uh, all your resources, to identify the projects at an early stage, to make sure that the projects happen, to beef up your infrastructure, both hard infrastructure and soft infrastructure, get the right capabilities, the right specialities into your healthcare system, so that you are ready to showcase your strengths when the final event happens. I think that's the biggest challenge. It needs a lot of planning. It's needs a lot of uh, working hand in hand, hand in hand with the government. But uh, that's, I think, the key success factor for any share in healthcare industry. How well you are positioned before 2020 happens. Okay, we have five this time. Put a picture on education. Like I said, I think what I'm talking uh, challenges are the resources required to build different uh, facilities. <coughs> Uh, in the sectors uh, we are focused on, but I would rather take them as more as opportunities. Uh, on education again, uh, the inflow of people uh, more to work out here, it gives you opportunity to look into uh, places uh, or, or opportunities where uh, you can uh, invest in it. Uh, similarly, in logistics, uh, when you see uh, it again, you create a huge infrastructure all related to uh, different things uh, in, uh, related to logistics. So you again have uh, different opportunities which you can identify uh, to invest uh, into this sector. Actually, I think so one of the challenges which we mentioned is our supply chain. The other challenge is you know, what we saw before in 2005 and 2007. Getting the right contractor, getting the right data, getting the right building construction material. So our cost of putting up that business remains in line with what we are projecting, what we are doing today. To manage a build out, to manage the offering, to manage the supply chain, and to get the right talent to make the right offering is going to be quite critical because we are all are serving in a service based industry. So that those are, are the big challenges. Excellent. We had earlier questions from delegate here on um, the front table um, about the manager selection. How do you Select the right measures and alternative investments. And regarding AMCL, regarding our massive capital, how is our massive capital capitalizing on these opportunities from horizon to my expert uh, Fine, uh, I'll answer. Formats is a uh, kind of conception. We have 
looked into opportunities which will benefit uh, the investors uh, or the community uh, and accordingly we have selected different sectors to invest in. And this process will continue uh, once or the development which happens uh, in the region uh, because of Expo. So we will look into opportunities which are there uh, in the different sectors, be it education, be it healthcare, uh, be it uh, the, the FNB lifestyle or the logistics sector. And uh, we will see uh, how uh, we can uh, invest into these sectors. We are looking into, uh, let's say, uh, uh, people resources uh, who have sector experience, who have been part of a team, who can identify these opportunities uh, and uh, make, make the company or the platforms uh, improve the next level. Regardless of what the oil price is, in two years, three years, we'll find it. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> The UI government uh, said uh, um, frequently that Dubai Expo 2020 shall also leave a long-term impact, a positive impact, well said, on the Dubai economy. Uh, what are the long-term impacts of the event as a whole and what do you think Dubai will rank among its peers by 2020? Yes, this, yeah. Uh, my biggest takeaway from the Expo event, as I would expect it to be, how does Dubai position itself? as a global center for tourism, trade and finance. So Expo 2020 can have many you know, different impacts in different sectors. But at the end of the day, the big story would be that after the Expo, has Dubai really established itself as one of the global centers along with London, along with New York, you know, that people talk about Dubai in the same breath as they talk about all these uh, centers of excellence. So that, I think, would be the real test for the city. And when I say that, I say that with a lot of optimism because what is happening today that Dubai has so many strengths, you know, it's so well connected with the entire world, it's the middle of the entire globe. You know, like two-thirds of the population, of the world's population are within eight hours of flying distance from Dubai. But, and it has got a fantastic infrastructure, uh, 190 nationalities living in the city. So a lot of strengths, but unfortunately, with whatever is happening in the region today, all these strengths are getting uh, overshadowed. So whenever we go out and speak to people, the only topic of discussion happens to be what is happening in Syria, what is happening in Yemen, what is the political environment, etc. So I think this, if, we, if the Expo becomes a great success as we are expecting it to be, then I would hope that this shift of the focus from whatever uh, is happening in the region today to real economy, real growth, that yes, there are pockets where there is uh, an environment to do business, to do trade, there is a lot of stuff that Dubai can really, you know, project to strength. Not only Dubai, the region is a whole. This will have a spillover effect of the entire region. So how the region comes out of that particular event, you know, that is the biggest uh, long-term impact so to say that we would expect from the event. And this requires joint yeah. efforts, for example, as you mentioned finance. So GIFC yeah. wants to triple its size within 10 years. Exactly. So even all the sectors, these are all, they are all strategies are geared around the Expo event. And this Expo is not only important for Dubai, it is as important for the Abu Dhabi, for example. It is as important for the entire region that yes, we are able to hold an event of such a stature you know, our infrastructure is beefed up to that extent, we are capable of holding this event of this mega kind of a proportion. I think that's the point that Dubai needs to be, and the region needs to be. We have one, one last comment from Anshul, and then we open to the floor <coughs> on uh, the tailwinds and uh, long-term impact. No, I guess Amrava has uh, summarized it uh, pretty well. Uh, I would say uh, uh, so that there's nothing more to add. You find it realistic that the uh, financial sector will also increase in size? I mean, we can't speak now for the GIFC, the name of the GIFC, but what you triple in size, you are expert on M&A and IPO and leverage and corporate finance, exactly, you still also send them more Yeah, because, see, uh, then, if you're talking of a certain activity at Expo side, you need finance, you need project finance, you need equipment finance, you need people, so, Banking, financial services industry sits as a top of the pyramid to catalyze the economy. And to catalyze the economy, whether 
when the oil price comes back, you have money into the system within low income. If not, looking at the trade and the economy, there is great finance programs available globally through which government finance, private sector finances. So we had the panel before, which not only talked about the equity capital markets, but also about the trade markets, also about alternative markets, which we spoke in, in the morning as well. So all those financing will also generate employment, will also add to the economy eventually. So I see, as Amitabha said, that it's just not a Dubai service sector event. It's an event which will exit the city, the country, the region. And how can you access an African customer from here? How can you access a Russian customer from here? Is it better to serve an Indian uh, customer by setting up a large mega scale factory over here because of government regulations, incentives, etc.? So, I, I think it will definitely have a long term impact not only to Dubai but to the wider region as well. Thank you very much indeed, gentlemen, for your points. Dear delegates, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, we have the last floor for questions. If you want to make you choose them, these are 52 years of combined experience. <laughs> so, who has the mic who wants um, to challenge our question? We have. Um, one question here, and the microphone is closed, I guess. Yeah. Oh, Terry Sawyer. Does anybody have the mic for the gentleman? Yeah, right. This Please. is the mic right at the back. Okay. Yeah? Okay, one question. Oh, okay. Then uh, we come back to you afterwards, sir. Terry Sawyer. One question regarding the business model of private equity. How to add value to your targets? Before the financial crisis, the business model of adding value. Just acquire a company of uh, a multiple of 10 and then uh, wait for uh, nine months or one year and then sell it at a multiple of 20. So, so could you speak, speak up please get closer to the mic? It's difficult to get you. It's okay now? Yeah, better. Okay. Uh, sh shall I repeat again the question? Yes, please. Okay. Before the financial crisis, the business model of, uh, of how uh, to add value to targets was based on financial investors like acquire a company at multiple of uh, uh, a multiple or any multiple at 10, 15 and then sell it after 6 months, 1 year, 25, 30 multiple. Okay? Now this uh, business model is no longer valid to have to have active role on how to add value to your targets. So uh, I know it is a very uh, tough uh, task 